Stanford University. as warm-up, and that's courtesy of our speaker today. Um, it shows you a little bit of what you're in for mm. if you thought you were uh, uh, in for just another ETL. So uh, there's no other uh, major announcements other than this is the, I mean, how's midterms going? <laughs> just, this is a time to relax for about an hour and, and be inspired and learn something about medical devices um, because we realize this is uh, that, that part of the quarter. This is the sixth of eight. Uh, eight. Um, different uh, talks of which, if you notice a pattern here, there, there is any pattern. We think entrepreneurship spreads on all, all over the globe, but also all over different kinds of sectors, including um, healthcare, which because we had the chancellor of UCSF and now we have Mark today. Uh, green tech, which next week we're going to have to kick off E-Week, uh, Bill Gross, uh, the CEO of eSolar. And of course, good old information technologies like we had last week with that uh, great visit by Mr. Dorsey. So with that, let me start the, uh, the official broadcast here. Welcome to the DFJ Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders Seminar Series brought to you by the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students, Stanford Technology Ventures Program, and the Department of Management Science and Engineering. Um, it is produced by the Stanford Center for Professional Development and generously underwritten by our good friends at DFJ. So today, uh, we have a guy who has a love of music like I do. He, play, he plays a wicked guitar. I'm not <laughs> sure he brought the guitar. He did bring the music. But he is CEO of a very important company, Optometica. Um, why do I say important and compelling company? It was founded by the chairman of the ophthalmology department here at the School of Medicine at Stanford University, Mark Blumenkrantz. Mark, sadly, uh, cannot join us today because he's at a conference in Florida, being you know, a, a professor and uh, thought leader in the technologies and science of this. But he, was, uh, he and his board um, recruited this Mark, uh, Forchette, to join them as CEO um, from after a long history of being at uh, Alcorn and uh, Alcorn, Alcorn, Alcon. Al Alcon, Alcon, excuse me, uh, tongue twister, Alcon, and um, you can see I'm not a, a medical science person <laughs> <laughs> myself, Alcon, but a long history, at a, that's a major pharma company. So he came out from the south where he went to Auburn um, and uh, joined the company recently. He's going to tell us all about that and tell us about uh, medical devices. So let's welcome Mark to Stanford University. Thanks. Tom, thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thanks. Good afternoon, Stanford. How are you guys doing? So um, let me, number one, let me begin by thanking Tom for, uh, for that introduction. And, uh, you know, I got to meet Tom in 2007 because his brother, uh, Brooke Byers, is the chairman of our board in Optometica. So I met him that way, but also met him through the Mayfield Fellows Program. We actually have uh, a couple of Mayfield Fellows uh, that are with Optometica. Uh, they're sitting right down here in front, and uh, it's a fantastic program, and Tom and uh, Tina Saley have done a, a wonderful job with it. So Tom asked me to speak about entrepreneurship and leadership, and that's exactly what I'm going to speak to you about this afternoon. But uh, I want to make a foundation statement first, and that is that... Um, when I was in college, I was an absolutely lousy student. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I interviewed on campus, I developed this kind of novel little technique, at least I thought it was novel. Uh, when the interviewer would ask me for my resume, I would flip it over face down and slide across the table and say, listen, why don't you and I just talk for a little bit? And uh, try, so, because I didn't want him to look down at my GPA. <laughs> and and uh, Something must have worked about it because I managed to get a great job on campus and that launched my career and somehow I wound up here today. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is uh, share a number of things with you about my, uh, my lessons that I've learned about entrepreneurship and leadership. As I, as I was thinking about framing uh, this talk, I was trying to think how to do this and, and convey some things uh, to you that might be really helpful. And you know, there's a great book by none other than Stanford's own Tina Selig uh, that is called What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. How many of you read, have read this book? So this is a fantastic book. I absolutely love it. Uh, and as I was thinking about how to frame this today, I thought, you know what, that's, that's kind of what I want to frame is pass along some of those lessons uh, to you today. Uh, so I thought what I'd do is I'll give you a little bit about my background, uh, then give you a little bit of background about Optometica, 
And then uh, some of these crystallized lessons I've learned over my career about leadership and entrepreneurship. Uh, so let's get going. And Tom gave you actually a, a really good uh, rundown on my background. Uh, so that was, <laughs> that was really good. But uh, I was born in South Alabama, as he mentioned. And uh, I went to school at Auburn University. I got a degree in marketing. And I got my first job through the placement center on campus. I interviewed with a company called Armor Dial. It's a consumer products company. And uh, I got a job as a field sales representative. It was a fantastic, uh, great first job. And uh, I got into it for a couple of years, and I, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot about business. But, you know, I also realized that's not what I wanted to do with my career. Uh, I, had, I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so I kind of squirreled away a bunch of money. And uh, after a couple of years in this position, I went into business with two college buddies of mine uh, that had founded a company called Donnelly Communications. And uh, so I joined them as a partner. And uh, Donnelly Communications was a nationwide 800 answering service. So uh, you look in the Wall Street Journal, you see a full page advertisement that asks for direct response. It has an 800 number at the bottom. And uh, we would handle the direct response. We maintain a call center 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, then we'd send the, the leads to the, the company. And so this was a great experience for me. Um, I learned a lot about business. I learned an incredible amount about sales in that position. Uh, but there was one problem. I was absolutely, because it was a boost, we financed it out of our own pocket. I was absolutely starving to death. <laughs> so, uh, so I made the decision to go into surgical sales. And I joined a company called Greasehopper. Now, Greasehopper was a 80, is a fantastic company. And is an 85-year-old Swiss surgical instrument company. Uh, handheld instrumentation, uh, kind of the, the Rolls Royce of ophthalmology. Exquisite craftsmanship, just astounding. I spent 14 years at Greasehopper. Started as a, a field sales representative. Uh, I worked my way up. I wound up running the U.S. organization. And one of the great things I learned in that, exp in, in that experience, that 14-year experience, is that product development done right uh, by a company working with physicians is kind of a symbiotic relationship that is incredibly rewarding. At Grease Harbor, we did that very well. Uh, we launched hundreds of new products uh, during that 14 years. And I learned a lot about that, that interacting with physicians. And I, I kind of got addicted to it. I mean, it just was unbelievable uh, in terms of personal reward. Uh, but uh, so we gained a great reputation, enough so that Alcon Laboratories, $7 billion Alcon at the time, division of Nestle, now uh, Novartis, uh, Alcon acquired us in 1998, asked me to come to Texas, which I did, uh, integrated Grease Harbor into Alcon. And this was a much different experience for me because a much larger company at the time, I think there were like 11,000 global employees. And Alcon was once again, another great work experience. I spent almost 10 years there. And uh, Alcon uh, is a incredible culture, wonderful people. I, I absolutely loved working there. Uh, it was uh, a place where we had tremendous success. I have the highest respect for that company. Uh, and I thought I was going to finish my career there. You know, massive market share gain. I felt like I had tons of wind in my sails, lots of momentum in my life, in my career. And I thought I would never leave, uh, never leave the company. But not so fast, uh, because that entrepreneurial urge was kind of still there. You know, I'll tell you why in a minute. And um, in early 2007, Mark Blumenkranz, Dr. Mark Blumenkranz at Stanford approached me and he said, you know, a company that I founded, Optometica, we're looking for a CEO and you should be that guy. And I was, I knew Mark for 20 years and, you know, I was in this great career that people never leave and I, you know, very respectfully, of course I'll think about it, Mark. <laughs> and and uh, so uh, I was just a little bit being polite and then Mark sicked Brooke Byers on me. Um, and the second that I met Brooke and I met Craig Taylor and I met the people at Optometica that I, that I could meet, um, I, I was really compelled uh, to make a change and made the decision to be the Optometica CEO. Uh, so <clears throat> I told Brooke when I made that decision, I said, man, 23 years in one place, I, I'm going to have to clear my head a little bit. And the people here that know me know that I love cars and I'm kind of fanatic about it. 
And I said, so uh, when I make this transition, I'm, I w I'm gonna drive from Texas, I'm gonna get in my car and I wanna drive down Route 66. I wanna drive from Texas to California, take three days and clear my head. And, uh, and so I did. So June the 2nd, 2007, I started driving across the desert, kind of racing. Uh, I think 84 there, was that was the, low, the slowest I went the whole time. Uh, but uh, uh, about halfway through the desert, you know, I, I found myself asking, what is making me do it? Why am I doing this? I mean, this was absolutely, felt like absolutely kind of crazy, you know, to, to leave such a great thing and do this. Well, there were a couple of reasons. Um, one is that element of being in medical devices, having breakthrough technology, uh, which I'm going to tell you about, was really compelling. And that was really exciting. Optomaticus technology, the stuff that you could see at the time was really exciting. The stuff that was in the lab that was not ready to go yet was incredibly exciting breakthrough technology. So that was one. The chance to work with Brooke, work with uh, Craig, work with Mark Blumenkranz, Daniel Planker, uh, people at Stanford. Uh, George Marcelino was really kind of the only guy at the time I knew in, in Optometica, excited about all them. But there was another piece, and this was kind of the tipping piece, that um, as I was driving across, there were these haunting lessons in life, things that I'd experienced at a kind of early age that made me say, I've got to do this. And I'm going to share those with you in a second. But before I do, so I said the first thing was technology that I, you know, I had to uh, have that. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about Optometica, uh, what the company's all about. So Optometica was founded in 2004, uh, and it was intended to address ophthalmology broadly. These are the founders, uh, five people, that's Mark Blumenkranz right there. Uh, and they intended to address retina, glaucoma, and cataract surgical instrumentation, femtosecond laser cataract sur surgical instrumentation, a, a category that had not even existed. Uh, so that was really uh, compelling. Um, the very first thing that we did at Optometica was license pattern scanning laser technology from Stanford. And that became Pascal, pattern scanning laser. And it's nothing short of a revolutionary treatment for diabetic retinopathy, uh, retinal, uh, retinal disease. Uh, with each uh, foot pedal depression of the laser, 56 spots are delivered to the eye, much less power, much less collateral damage, a much more comfortable patient experience. So this was a really fantastic product that really changed the way retinal laser is delivered. And we achieved some fantastic milestones. In three and a half years, we sold 600, more than 600 systems in 40 markets around the world, treated more than a million patients, delivered more than 40 million patterns uh, to patients' eyes successfully. Some great milestones, and, and that was successful enough that it caught the attention of a distributor of ours in some major markets, Topcon Medical. And last year, in August, Topcon acquired the retina glaucoma part of Optometica. So they acquired our only revenue generating business, uh, which was a great win-win uh, because they got this revolutionary portfolio of products. Uh, it was great for them. We felt good about it because they were a great partner. Uh, we were able to then also, though, turn our attention solely to that femtosecond laser cataract project that had been kind of stewing in the background uh, since the founding of the company. Uh, so that was a fantastic thing for us. And when we were thinking about femtosecond laser cataract surgery as that next step, um, number one, it's a huge market. Does anybody in here know how many cataract procedures are done globally per year? Anybody want to take a guess? Quiet room. 15 to 16 million procedures per year. So we're aiming at a really large market. And um, we asked ourselves sort of aspirational questions. What if we could combine innovative imaging with the precision of femtosecond laser? Could we deliver precision in surgery that could improve patient outcomes? Could we change the procedure and, and improve the visual benefit at the end? And you know what? There's some opportunities because traditional cataract surgery has its challenges. What you see here is kind of the way a procedure is done today uh, with uh, manual instrumentation. So this is a forceps that the physician punctures a hole in the anterior capsule and then they manually, they're trying to tear a perfect circle. This is like cellophane. You're trying to tear a perfect circle of cellophane with the forceps. It's absolutely, it's like the power steering on one of my old cars. It doesn't work very well. So uh, this, uh, so it can be out of round. These are things that can go, it can be out of round. It can be larger than the target that you intended. 
As you're doing this, you might get a big remnant or a tag, or you might be making the tear and it go totally out of control in around the equator, which is an adverse event. So uh, the reason they try to gain access this way is because they need to get to the cataract in the natural human lens, and they use this ultrasound device here, and they pulverize it uh, into little pieces and aspirate the nucleus out. So they chop and segment it. As they do that, they can break that capsule that's on the backside. That's an adverse event. So uh, you create this opening in the, in the lens. The physician then implants a intraocular lens. It's an implant that stays in the bag and it's made of an, like an acrylic material. And the objective is to have it perfectly seat because that bag shrink wraps around the, uh, the lens. But what can happen is if you don't line those up properly, it can go out of sync. It can tilt shift the center. And what happens when that occurs is the patient gets less than a perfect visual outcome. So real simply, that's one of the challenges, and that's what we intend to, intended to address with the Catalyst Precision Laser System. Uh, so this product is not on the market yet, but it's going to be. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is what it does. It uses precise femtosecond laser to create the circular cut, uh, precise size and shape. It uses femtosecond laser to, to dice this into easily aspiratable cubes. Um, that the physician can use without ultrasound, makes precise incisions here in the cornea to address astigmatism, and then it provides multi-plane incisions to enter the eye uh, with that ultrasound device. So um, this is pretty spe spectacular technology, and we believe it delivers precision that will change everything. Now, that's kind of a big statement. But I think this is a landscape shift in this, tech, in, the, in this surgical procedure. By replacing those manual steps, we're going to take cataract surgery to an entirely new uh, stratosphere. I mean, I, I can see everything getting rethought in terms of the things that are used today, which is really exciting. Um, and I think this is the driver of the new standard. What you wind up with ultimately is this implant with a, a precisely positioned capsule precise alignment uh, post the procedure. So that's really, that's really cool. So that's what Optometica is thinking about every day. That's the technology. And so as, uh, as I'm going into work every day and you have this highly energized team working on this technology, working, is really excited about what we're doing, I find myself constantly every day managing, you know, the day-to-day -day things. And I'm drawing on lessons that I've learned throughout my life, uh, things that I've learned about being an entrepreneur, things I've learned about leadership, and I say so far because I'm sure every day I'll walk away with something else that I learn. So let me tell you about lesson number one. Uh, and lesson number one is one that I, um, uh, is my year between my senior year of high school and my first year of college. And um, I was a desk clerk in the summertime at a Howard Johnson's hotel on the interstate. And I kind of liked that job as a, a kid because you got to wear a coat and tie. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, now it's not. <laughs> but um, I was a desk clerk at the Howard Johnson's, and one summer night, car pulls up in front, and this well-dressed gentleman walks out and uh, walks in, and I ask him to sign in. I put the card in front of him. He reached down and picked up a pen and wrote his name, and he wrote Ray Kroc. And I stopped him. I put my hand down, and I said, not the Ray Kroc that found a McDonald's. You know, I was 18 years old. It's funny, I'd, some bizarre coincidence, I had just like read an article like three days before about him. Or else I probably wouldn't have known who he was. Um, but he, and he said, yeah, that's me. And man, I couldn't believe it. I thought, what an opportunity to talk to him. So I just hammered him with questions. <laughs> and so uh, he, uh, he said, you know what? I'll tell you what, I'm going to go put my stuff down and I'll come back and I'll sit down and talk to you. Yeah, right. Uh, so, but he did. He put his stuff down. He came back and walked in the lobby, sat down and talked to me. And um, I remember this remarkable conversation. And when he walked out of the door that evening, I remember thinking, man, I want to do what that guy does. I want to be a CEO. I want to create a culture. I want to create a company. And it had this huge impact on me. And so, um, you know, the rest of my life, uh, in my work career, every day I'm making decisions. I'm thinking, I want to do that. So lesson number one, know what you want. Set your objectives. I promise you'll achieve it. I promise. Lesson number two, you must have passion. 
Now, uh, for this lesson, I'm going to go back to when I was interviewing on campus at, uh, at Auburn. And uh, uh, every week, companies came in, and they'd put their names up, and you'd see who you want to interview and sign up. And I saw this company, Armor Dial. You know, this was, you know, in the early 19, Armor Dial. Wow, I love their products. I want to interview, so I signed up. And I went into the interview and shook the guy's hand. I sat down, and he started asking me the usual questions. And about midway through, he said, what do you, how much do you know about our company? And I said, are you kidding? I love your products. I use them every single day. And he said, uh, really, how is that? And I said, well, every day that I've been a senior here at Auburn for lunch, my lunch has been a can of Armour Vienna, six saltine crackers, and a Miller Lite. <laughs> and he kind of he laughed. And he said, uh, <laughs> you mean you really eat this stuff? And I said, no, not only that, I absolutely love it. I would love to sell your product. Now, I knew nothing about sales at that time, absolutely nothing. But I had a lot of passion for Vienna sausage and beer. Uh, <laughs> and um, and so, uh, so that passion got me my job. Uh, that was a really big lesson. Uh, for me when, when I learned that. Be, and, that and that enthusiasm uh, has a big role in success. Technique, skill, yes, enthusiasm plays a big role. Lesson number three, absolutely, no matter what you do, you must learn how to sell. You know, a lot of people think that uh, sales might be something you're kind of born with. You know, you got, you're just a natural born salesman. Not true. Sales is a skill. You have to learn how to ask questions. You have to learn how to present, identify needs, handle objections, do trial closes. Close a close should be a natural conclusion to a discussion. It shouldn't be pressured because uh, that means you probably haven't done it right. Um, it's a profession. And you know what? Everybody sells. You're going to sell. It, you know, I have to sell to my board. I have to sell to my investors sell to the employees, sell to my spouse, sell to my children. Everybody that you contact with in your lifetime, you're going to have to, in, to sell in some way. It's a great thing to learn. Now, this book, I'm just curious. How many of you have ever seen this book, How to Master the Art of Selling? Uh, so we got a couple. I, when I put this up, I thought, man, I'm really old school. This was printed in 1980. <laughs> um, so, but, but this became almost just like a foundation for me. Three buddies of mine and I bought the book at the same time, and we made it like a lifestyle. We said, we've got to be unconsciously competent with this. So we all you know, roomed together. We had a big house that we lived in. And uh, he said, you know what? If we're going to go to the movie, we're going to have to sell each other to go to the movie. If we're going to go to dinner, you're going to have to sell each other to go to dinner. And it made it you know, become something that, uh, that we got pretty good at. Learn how to sell. Lesson number four, there's no failure that you can't recover from. You're going to go out and you're going to take a big swing in life. And if you fail, you know what? So what? So you can recover from it. You know, uh, there, you're going to be in the weeds in your career, and you just you just need to believe in yourself and find a way to get out of it. Now, I had a uh, really interesting uh, thing happen here when I was with Donnelly Communications, my own business. I was up to my neck in debt. I didn't have a dime to my name. I, uh, every credit card maxed out. And uh, nevertheless, I believed in my product, and I said, you know what, I've got to get to ad agencies in New York City. So I drove from Alabama up to New York City, and I was pounding up and down Madison Avenue uh, every day calling out ad agencies. And one night, I went to the Port Authority bus terminal. I was staying in New Jersey, and I went to the Port Authority bus terminal to get the bus home. I missed it. I didn't have any money to get a bus ticket. And uh, I was standing in the bus station, and I said, you know what? This feels pretty much like failure <laughs> because things weren't going that well. I had no money, and I was in the Port Authority bus terminal at like midnight. I had no idea how I was going to get home. And uh, so I started looking around, and over in the corner is a guy playing the guitar. Now, Tom said I played the guitar, and I had on a gray pinstripe suit and wingtips with holes in them. And I walked up to the guy, and I said, hey, dude, at some point, you're going to need to go to sleep. 
and when you do, can I play your guitar? Because I need to get bus fare to go back home. And he said, yeah, sure. And he handed it to me. So I, I got bus fare. Uh, I made some tips and uh, <laughs> managed to get home. And then <clears throat> three days later, I got my first job in surgical sales. So I mean, it was just a kind of a, I felt like, man, I'm big time in the weeds. Uh, but it was, a, it was kind of a nice recovery. No failure you can't recover from. Lesson number five. Strategy and tactical implementation equals success. Now, strategy is sexy and cool. Everybody loves to talk about strategy. But the rubber meets the road in executing a plan. If you can't execute the plan, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. Now, there's a great example of this at Alcon. Uh, when I was there. Uh, we had this massive success with the product you see here on the left, and it launched at the exact same time as a product by its chief competitor. And at the time, the chief competitor had the lion's share of the market, and Alcon was kind of the also-ran. In five or six years, totally flipped the market, and Alcon earned more of its fair share. Why? Well, it was great technology, absolutely. You can't do it without that. But it was tactical implementation that made a huge difference. We were intensely focused on cut, managing customers, relationships, uh, doing the right things every single day, messaging, uh, branding, making sure everything was run like a really well-oiled machine. And that made the difference here. Uh, so that uh, tactical implementation and strategy equals success. Now those uh, uh, people here at Optometica, uh, get to hear a lot of my sayings over and over and over. This is one of them. Uh, the most dangerous thing in the world is a past success you're still in love with. You know what? You have to live like your best day is always in front of you. You have to live for the future and take the things that you've done in the past and you know what? They're in your rear view mirror. Uh, you can kind of celebrate them for a little bit, but keep moving. And uh, surviving success is one of the hardest things to do. So there's a great example here if you think about Optometica and Pascal. Pascal, you know, by almost any metric you look at, you say, that was an incredible success. I mean, we're feeling really good about what we had accomplished. And it was a pretty audacious decision to take something your success and just say, OK, we're going to transact it away. Uh, that, was, that felt really wild. Um, but you know what? It was because we had our eyes on the goal of the femtosecond laser cataract system, the huge opportunity. We made sure that we were good stewards of what we had built, put it in the hands of a company that was going to execute well with it, and, um, and focused on this, this uh, future potential. So uh, uh, best day has to always be in front of you. Lesson number seven, do it for something other than money. Uh, you know, I think uh, if you're focused on money and that's your goal, uh, you're, you're going to get it pretty quick. And, you know, uh, money is just the byproduct, I think, of really good work. It just kind of shows up uh, if you do things right. Um, and if, uh, if that happens really early, then that was kind of a hollow exercise. Uh, having a higher order goal is really important if you want to drive your career and stay challenged every single day and want to achieve. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to be in the medical device industry because the products that we make impact people and improve their lives. And it's not witnessed anywhere better than in this slide right here. So when we were developing the femtosecond system, you know, you do all kinds of bench tests, lab tests, safety studies, all this work to finally get in the clinic. And there does come that day where you use it the first time in humans. And so uh, we set up our clinical trial in the Dominican Republic and uh, we're screening patients. And one particular woman raised her hand and said, I want to be the first. Really? Why? Why do you want to be the first? She said, I want to be the first because I know that if I can help you get this product to market, if I can help you uh, get this uh, into surgery, it will benefit millions of people's vision and improves millions of people's lives. Now, I couldn't have scripted that better. And you know what? Those are the moments that you work for. Uh, that's an incredible higher order uh, thing to, to feel uh, with your career. So do it for something other than money. Lesson number eight, people do business with people they like. Great example of this is the TopCon transaction last year when we transacted away the retina and glaucoma business. Um, you know, and I say that because probably four separate times that I can think of while we were in that negotiation, 
I, I felt like we kind of hit a wall. You know, I, I, I thought this might tip the other way. This might not happen. And the reason, the way that we would get over that is the person at TopCon that was in charge of it on their side and I would get on the phone. We really liked each other. We both shared the vision that this was great for us and them. We both wanted to make it happen. And we would pound through really difficult is issues because we believed that, you know what, this is, this is good for both companies. And so uh, uh, business is a contact sport. And uh, I would uh, highly encourage you to think about that and treasure the relationships that you build because uh, uh, they're really meaningful to your success. Lesson number nine, prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, nothing takes the place of preparation and uh, building a great game plan and executing it is uh, incredibly important. Uh, now, how many of you are football fans? How many of you are Stanford football fans? Okay. okay. Um, well, I've never met Jim Harbaugh, but I would bet money that if I met Jim Harbaugh, he would say that games are won by outstanding recruiting, outstanding training, developing a strategy, practicing that, delivering that on game day. And Stanford did a great job of that this year. You guys had a, you guys had a pretty great season, so you should feel pretty good. Now, I would be remiss in this conversation <laughs> if I didn't mention my Auburn Tigers that, in case you didn't hear, they won the national championship. So. Uh, I love this picture of Gene Chizik, who's the coach at Auburn. Uh, and um, uh, this picture of him with his game plan in his hand, laminated and you know, uh, when, if you really, if you ever dive in, see how they do that. They watch film intensely. They think through every single play and scenario so that we're in the heat of battle. They've done all the homework. They know exactly what to do. And one of the things I heard Gene Chizik say uh, a lot during the season this year was they'd go in the first half uh, and they, you know, maybe wouldn't uh, have something just right. They'd have to tweak at halftime. They'd come back and win the game. The Alabama game was 24 to nothing almost at half, and Auburn came back and won it. So that was, um, that was a fantastic example of preparation. Um, lesson number 10, put the right people in the right seats. Now, this is kind of my last lesson, uh, and I kind of did these a little bit in chronological order, but this is probably the single most important thing for you to think about as you launch in your career, making sure the right people are in the right seats. You know, people at Optometica hear me say a lot, weapons don't win battles, people do. Uh, if you don't have the right people in the right seat, you have to correct it. Uh, everybody on the team probably knows that they're not the right person in the right seat. And you know what? It goes further than you might naturally think. Uh, you know, it's natural when people hear this statement to think, oh, I need to make sure the people that work for me are the right people. Um, but you know what? It goes way beyond that. You need to make sure you have the right seat in your board. You need to make sure you have the right investors. You need to make sure you have the right team. You have the right advisors. Um, you need to make sure that your friends share your values and that you guys are good for each other. And you need to make the right decisions in your personal life. You know, one of the most important decisions I ever made in my life was my, my wife uh, and the spouse that I have. And she's incredibly supportive uh, for me. That's an important decision. And that's another way of thinking about having the right people in the right seat. So, um, you know, I started out here by referencing Tina's book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. Uh, so, you know, maybe one day you know, something really cool happens. Maybe I write my own book and I was kind of thinking what I would call it. And you recall how I started my career. Well, I think I would probably name mine The Vienna Files. Uh, you know, people would think this is like a global business book. It's about Vienna sausage. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the subtitle, though, uh, you know, Tina has a really slick one, but mine would be 10 Lessons Learned During My Journey from a Tiny South Alabama Town to Becoming a Medical Device CEO in Silicon Valley. Where's Tina? Is she? she oh, so we was, OK, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> So I, I need a little help on the subtitle. That's why I'm a medical device CEO and not, a, not an author. Uh, but but uh, that's probably what it would be. So now, those are my 10 lessons. But I do, because I'm here at Stanford today, I do have one bonus lesson for you guys. And that is I look around this room, and this room is full of choices to be made. And uh, if you think about life and you think about as you go out in your career, every day when you wake up, you get to make a choice. You get to make a choice to work hard, to have a positive outlook, to stare things in the face and uh, not, not be daunted by them. 
uh, that's a choice that you get to make. Success is a choice you make. It's a great book by Rick Pitino. Uh, I encourage you to pick it up and read it. Um, but you also have an asset behind you that's very powerful. You have a very powerful brand behind you in Stanford. So leverage that brand, leverage your skills, leverage your knowledge, leverage every gift that you have, and go out and do something great with it. So thanks. So I think we've uh, got some questions here, uh, and so, so I'll start yes, ma'am. Um, as I talked to you before we came into class, and we talked about uh, you and the company and the decisions you've made. And one of the things we were really curious about is it's very unusual for a company to sell its entire revenue stream, basically, yeah. and to still remain a company. Yeah. We were wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that in terms of what did it do to the culture? Did the culture change? Did some of the people have to go with the acquisition? Yeah. Where did the money go? Did yeah. you did you use that money to change out your investor pool? Or if you could just talk a little bit about what went on behind the scenes there and, and how you navigated that. Yeah. that, that was you, you know, it's, so it's a, uh, uh, let me repeat the question for those of you who uh, may not first. So it's, it, it was a question about the transaction with TopCon. And uh, when, when we made that decision, what, what impact did it have on, uh, on the, the people? Did people go with it? Uh, how did we make that decision? Was it a good, uh, a, you know, good thing for everyone? And uh, what happened with the structure of the board and, uh, and the structure of the company? And um, uh, what else? So, and, and what happened and with the culture. The, the culture and the money? So, um, yeah, so you know, it's a really interesting thing. There, there's not a lot of uh, cookbooks on how to do that. Uh, you know, to transact away your revenue stream. And so um, we felt a lot of times like we were sort of blazing some new ground. Um, and uh, the first thing is we had to really think about the, the decision to do that. We, we really thought long and hard and said, okay, we need to really be successful and focus on this big opportunity that exists in Cataract. At the same time, my management team and all the people in the company were intensely committed to the customers in the retina business. You know, if you think about it, um, you know, I mean, I spent 23 years in retina. These were not just, these are friends, you know. And so when a product is in the hands of a friend, you feel intensely um, responsible to make sure that they're having a good, good, uh, a good experience. So uh, we, folk, we, we uh, had a lot of discussions about we, if we're going to do this and we're going to, uh, you know, succeed in cataract, we've got to be focused on cataract. And this responsibility to what we had already accomplished was very dilutive. And every day, I mean, we, we get in my staff meetings and, you know, it, we're constantly managing the amount of discussion about retina in this huge opportunity. It's really hard to do. So we made the decision, it's, it's best for the company to do this. And, um, and then we started thinking about all the elements of uh, once we decided to do this with TopCon, we got through the negotiations. Then we started thinking about, um, you know, that's got to be successful. I mean, we can't abandon the customers. And so uh, TopCon was very, uh, very much one of the employees that manufactured all the skills they had, you know, to go, to go with it. And uh, that was kind of a hard thing to do because, you know what, we're in right in the middle of Silicon Valley. And one of the things I learned really quickly is if people aren't happy with their jobs, they can probably go across the street around noon and get another one. <laughs> so, uh, so it was really uh, delicate. And it required a lot of personal sitting down with people, talking with them, you know, making sure they understood. Uh, we did things as a company to make sure that it was... Uh, it, you know, uh, it was, was, was good for them in a lot of ways. And, uh, and then we maintained some interaction at a pretty high level through the transaction to, to make that occur. Um, what happened to the culture of Optometica is, uh, is, is really kind of amazing that I remember walking into the office uh, when some of the milestones of the transaction were passed and walking in the office and saying, you know, all I'm thinking about today is cataract. I mean, this is just like incredible. You know, it was, it was like instant clarity. Um, but then what also happens is you get that instant clarity and you also go, man, we've got so much to do because now you're thinking of it at a deeper level. It's like, wow, we got a lot, of, a lot to do. And so um, 
we, uh, we had some key objectives and things that everybody had to get focused on, and it became just this intense effort. Uh, very exciting. But we went from a revenue generating company to kind of back to a startup, but a really, really well infrastructured startup. Um, so uh, one of the things that occurs is we kept some infrastructure that you wouldn't typically have in a startup. You know, we had some commercial infrastructure that maybe didn't match up with the rent. So we kept that and, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to change that. I mean, those are great people we work long and hard to get to. So uh, our board made a great commitment that we're going to, we're not going to play to just play in cataract. We're playing to win. And uh, so we kept that infrastructure. The money from the transaction, you know, our, our board said, <laughs> we want you guys to succeed. Um, and, uh, and we want you to have everything that you need. And so it's, you know, it stayed. And uh, it's a really remarkable thing. I mean, I, you know, I was talking with Brooke. I mean, he's had so many experiences. And he said, man, this is like a case study. Uh, I mean, it's, it, and one of the things I'm, I'm really proudest of 